Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> While we wait for everyone to join in the chat window, please type your name, institution, and one thing you'd like to walk away with from uh, the webinar today. You'll notice that at the bottom, you there's a chat icon. You can just tap on that and type in your name in the chat. And one thing that you'd like to walk away with today. Wonderful. I see all of these great messages coming through. Um, please keep typing in your name and one thing you'd like to walk away with your, and your institution. Um, I will be monitoring the chat, so if you have any questions during the call, please type them in the chat and we will make sure that Drs. Nagai and Shanley receive them. Um, I'd just like to welcome everyone for another engaging topic. Thank you for joining us today. We, have, we hope that you find the dialogue valuable around the indigenous education and, and higher education. Um, I am Rosie Scandone, Associate Director for the Office of Access and Success at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. In my role, I help lead professional development for our member institutions, specifically our Council of 1890 Universities and the Commission of Access, Diversity, and Excellence. Uh, now I'd like to have our CADE Chair and President of Florida International University in Miami, Florida, who will be introducing our speakers, uh, Dr. Mark Rosenberg. Dr. Hi, Rosenberg, everybody. Hi, I'm here. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being on. Thanks to APLU and uh, welcome to this, this webinar on commission on, uh, from the Commission on Access, Diversity, and and excellence and the Office of Access and Success. Our, our, our goal is to make sure that we are understanding what some of the current challenges are to our communities, that we understand what state of the art and best practice looks like, and that we have a, a good conversation about how we can uh, improve things. And uh, we're really pleased that we're gonna in address uh, a number of dimensions related <laughs> best practices by looking at uh, uh, Montana's experiences in implementing uh, education, the Indian Education for All Act uh, from the K through 16 for over uh, the last couple years. And also we're gonna discuss uh, how higher education institutions outside of Montana are gonna are bring about understanding across campus uh, to, uh, to create a more nurturing and safe environment for native students. I want to thank uh, Catherine uh, Shanley, who's Chair and Professor of Native American Studies and Special Assistant to the Provost of Native American and Indigenous Education at the University of uh, Montana, Missoula, uh, for being uh, one of our, of our specialists who's going to help us. Also, uh, Phyllis Nagai, who's the Adjunct Associate Professor of Communication Studies at the University of Montana, uh, Missoula. Uh, I believe that we're going to start uh, first with uh, Dr. Shanley. And there'll be a question and answer at the end of the talk. Obviously, uh, feel free to uh, to be, be entering material or questions in the chat. Uh, and um, But we'll start, first of all, with, uh, with Dr. Shanley. <clears throat> uh, greetings from the University of Montana in Missoula. It is the Aboriginal homeland of the Salish and Ponderay peoples, a number of whom are our colleagues, students, and friends. We honor their contributions and the past they've always shown us in caring for this place and for future generations. Panamia to the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. That is, thank you for inviting us to speak with you today we're especially grateful to the staff of the Office of Access and Success of APLU, Rosie, 
um, has been an extraordinary help and support. We appreciate having the opportunity to share our thoughts with you today about Indigenous education and higher education. First, I introduce myself by my Nakota name, Ia Wakawia, Sacred Stone Woman. My English name is Catherine Winona Shanley. I am an enrolled member of the Fort Peck Nakoda, which is also popularly known as the Cinnaboyne people from Northeastern Montana. As a scholar, my focus has been on Native American literature, but recently I've expanded my work to the broader field of global indigenous studies and co-edited a volume, Mapping mm. Indigenous Presence, which links Norway's Sami people with the Native North American people of Montana and Indian country in the U.S. I'm Phyllis Ngai with the Department of Communication Studies. I am a descendant of the Hakka people whose Aboriginal homeland is located in Hong Kong and South China. I have been studying and researching about in Indigenous education for nearly two decades now. I'm the author of Crossing Mountains, uh, which is a study based on research conducted on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Restoration and other publications about Indigenous education as a form of global education. We appreciate the opportunity to present our ideas to you about how campuses can meaningfully shape infrastructure to support Native American student success. And we look forward to a rich exchange of ideas at the end. First, we will make the case for seeing Native American students as individuals from diverse, back, from diverse cultural, intellectual, social, and familial backgrounds. Rather than seeing the Native American student as the monolithic representation of indigenous, indigenous youth across America, we choose to talk about identity and identification as dynamic processes. Second, we show respectfully we respectfully suggest that what happens in the classroom connects to what happens in the cafeteria or in the admissions office or at the football game. In other words, the whole campus needs to be involved in promoting the success of Native American students and will be enriched in the process. Making that happen involves new frameworks for institutional engagement and pedagogical transformation. Third, we offer suggestions for ongoing assessment activities. And we'll talk about the structural change that will help us assess the progress of our Indian education for all efforts for increased effectiveness and appropriate change. Well, let's start with this rhetorical question. What makes Montana's educational system unique? And what can others learn from Montana's example? We believe is how we strive to integrate indigenous education as a form of place-based multicultural education for social justice. In 1972, Montana revised the state constitution to include a three-part mandate, um, equality of educational opportunity for each person of the state. Um, that includes people such as Hutterites who have communities north of us and Amish people whose um, children do not attend public schools per se. Um, recognition of the distinct and unique cultural heritage of American Indians and a commitment to its education in its educational goals to the preservation of their cultural integrity and a basic system of free quality public elementary and secondary schools. So please reference the Montana Office of Public Instruction website under Indian Education to hear more history about how implementation of the constitutional mandate unfolded from 1972 until 1999. 
um, just as a bit of a spoiler, it took the Supreme Court of Montana to actually put teeth in the law, finally. Um, House Bill 528, um, which was um, passed in the late 1990s, um, put a statute in place, firmly in place, to address the legislative, even with legislation, the intent of the Constitution. As you see here, the Indian Education for All Act emphasizes that all Montanans need to be educated about Native cultures and histories, and how educators must pay special attention to tribes in their regions. School infrastructures must provide personnel with the knowledge and tools to fulfill the constitutional mandate. I apologize for the busy slides. Since this presentation will be available for further use, having the detail may come in handy. Um, well, this, we want to tell you a little bit about Montana. Montana is home to seven reservations and 12 tribes, one of which does not have a reservation. That's the little shell Chippewa. The tribes and the names they call themselves are listed on the bottom here. This map shows the tribal boundaries defined by the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851 and the Flathead and Blackfeet Treaties of 1885. As you can see, the reservations are all significantly smaller than the original lands occupied by the tribes in the 1850s. We offer this map to share with you a little, yeah, a little about Montana, as I said. But at the same time, this illustrates the type of place based essential understandings that Indian Education for aims to integrate in topic education. These images represent how the tribal nations represent themselves and the landscape of their homelands. Montana is home to approximately 78,000 people of American Indian heritage or about 9% of the state's total population. 14% of Montana public K-12 students are American Indian. 44.6% of American Indian students attend a school physically located within a reservation. Every reservation has its own tribal college. The majority of students attending tribal colleges are American Indians. At the major state universities in Montana, about 4 to 6 percent of the student populations are American Indian. At the University of Montana, Missoula here, we have between 500 to 600 Indian students from tribal nations and urban centers in and outside of Montana. For our purposes in this presentation, we offer these demographics to indicate the relatively large indigenous population in the rural state. Knowledge about and in part written by the tribal peoples of Montana has been shaped by seven essential understandings that cover identity, culture, history, and sovereignty. Transformation of curricula and enhancement of student support would be impossible for staff and faculty without a basic template for the key concepts. Um, again, see the Montana Office of Public instruction website for more detail. The next question we would like to explore with you is, how does Indian education for work in higher education in Montana? How do the students' needs change and educators' performance shift? Um, in order to talk about that, I'd like to give a little bit of historical background. The Office of the Commissioner of Higher Ed, which I'm going to be calling OCHI, um, has within it an Office of American Indian and Minority Achievement. Um, that office was started many, many years ago, decades ago, probably three or more, by American Indian parents who wanted 
to make sure that the state understood its mandate to educate Indians. So that is called the AMA office. And OCHI, a couple of years ago, appointed a task force through AMA to, of educators from around the state to implement, to implement Indian Ed for All in higher ed. Um, so in the summer of 2018, the following plan was finalized and sent to institutions as a model of transformation that provides the necessary framework for assessment metrics as well. The first thing we did, we um, did. I'm on that task force. Um, I've been involved in this. I was involved in the drawing up the central understandings about um, seven or 20 years ago. Anyway, um, we identify an individual from each campus um, who be a more, at a more senior level who will serve as the point of contact for American Indians. In other words, this is a go-to person who should know things about the current state of American Indian student success on any given campus. Um, and the person will be available as the first point of contact to guide American Indian students to the appropriate college personnel as needed to address problems or specific needs. On our campus, we decided rather than have one single person, we'd have a triumvirate of people who do that, including the American Indian Student Services Department, Native American Studies, and now we have a new role of a tribal um, recruitment person. Um, and then we assign departmental points of contact in key areas. So you can see from one and two that we're looking at portals, identify where students come in. And I always speak of them as portals and leaks, that some of those places are where students leak out because they don't get the kind of help and uh, support they need. You may have different ones on your campus, but the ours include financial aid and housing and so on. And third, we wanted to make sure that our data collection was appropriate and useful for future planning. Um, because we just are beginning to roll this out, I we can't tell you a whole lot about how the data piece is working, except we have a new dashboard that will be coming up soon. And it's got incredible detail to help us see which students come in from tribal colleges and maybe assess their needs differently, um, which students we have a um, American Indian tuition waiver that some students qualify for and others do not, which students are on Pell Grant. Um, so our data is going to show in depth their tribal affiliation in as much as they Give it. So the fourth thing is also to provide a common American Indian cultural humility professional development for all faculty and staff. By cultural humility, we're trying, it's the latest kind of vocabulary for replacing the notion that through these uh, little training sessions you can create uh, cultural competency. Um, it's, it's a more modest goal, as it were, to think that at the very least you can become humble about what you don't know. Um, and then the last is to incorporate similar kinds of things to all new employees, including faculty. In addition to all those, um, in August, OCHI mandated that all staff and faculty in the Montana University system, we're talking about over 5,000 people, uh, complete a one to two hour online Indian education for course. And this is the home page of the online course. As you can see um, under the table of contents, the course includes Indian education for background, um, for example, the constitutional and legal foundations, an introduction to Montana Tribal Nation, 
including a video where respected tribal members from each tribal nation talk about what they want the public to know about their people and life ways. It's a beautiful video. If we have time, we would like to show you a couple minutes of that towards the end, and let's see how time goes. Um, this course also includes educational resource tab, including links to a rich collection of teaching materials created by tribal education departments and non-tribal educators over the past 15 years or so. Um, frequently asked basic questions about American Indians, something like Indian Education 101, including answers to questions such as, what is the reservation? Which term is more appropriate to use? Uh, American Indian or Native American? That kind of question. Um, to access all this information, you don't need to be Montana educators. So for those who are interested, um, you can actually uh, find a similar course uh, that anyone can access uh, through our Montana Office Topic Instruction website. At this point, I'd like to emphasize that the for all aspect of Montana's project to create the best possible quality education involves the basic information the seven essential understandings provide and the imperative to rethink our own positions, uh, who we are as a collective, who we've been, and who we're becoming. In other words, the whole of our state needs the vital knowledge about American Indians to understand who we are. Um, additionally, allowing people to be who they are, we are, um, Native people, involves recognition of their, our cultural sovereignty and not being seen as vanishing Americans. We labor under stereotypical um, notions of Indians. Um, in this slide, I try to just break out as an almost um, reiterative exercise the two strands here. Educate all Montanans. That's a foundational change in essential understandings. Inclusion and diversity to rethink who we are. That's strand one. Strand two is educate Indian students in a culturally responsible manner. Um, that involves um, that it was originally driven by the idea that Native students left our school systems in great numbers. Student services, family educational, we use state family educational model, that is we see the student as part of a matrix with cultural adaptation. Along with that, we've, we've uh, created, we want to create cultural Safety, and one of the things we've done is we've created a cultural hardship code within the student conduct manual so that professors understand how to, um, would, that Native students sometimes need to take extended uh, time off, like a week off for a funeral, and that it isn't just immediate family, that because of the matrix of family that's so important to Native Americans, it may be um, more culturally sensitive to allow them more time. So circling back to the beginning, what is meant by a culturally responsive manner in education? How can it be constitutionally or otherwise mandated in higher ed education? This, this uh, question is a little bit Cynical. I uh, recognizing that pushback may come from some quarters where people do not appreciate what diversity and inclusion involve or feel left out. On our campus, we're working on a set of small group discussions, a website of resources, ongoing faculty and staff development, course assessments of content. Um, in the last several years, We've revised our research protocols of indigenous peoples and adopted a cultural hardship code to educate faculty and staff about students' needs to sometimes be away from campus for extended family funerals and ceremonial happenings. Um, I want to say in here also that um, part of what we're 
attempting to do in assessing when we have attempted to assess Indian Ed for All curricula, um, there tends to be a, um, for lack of a better word, self-promotion or spin that people took put on their reporting of what they're doing in their departments. So we're trying to develop metrics and assessment tools that dig down deep in terms of what kinds of change are happening. One of our main goals is to bridge the achievement gap. The college enrollment rate for American Indian and Alaska Native young adults is the lowest among all the ethnic groups as you can as you can see um, in this graph. The percentage of American Indians who have at least a bachelor degree is the lowest of all racial ethnic groups, and American Indians are among the most underrepresented subgroups in graduate program. Uh, a recent ACT report finds that American Indian students have the second lowest rate of college readiness among students of all racial ethnic groups with, with, with respect to Native Americans who go on to post-secondary education, only about half of them who enroll in major colleges and universities survive the first year as compared to almost 70% of the general population. This graph from the Montana American Indian Student Achievement Data Report 2018 shows the capture rate and the remediation rate. The capture rate is the rate of students who enroll in college within 16, 16 months of graduating. The capture rates for American Indian students are much lower than for white students in Montana. Remediation rate is a way of tracking students once they enter college. It is the rate of students who enter college within 16 months of graduating high school and enroll in either a, a remedial writing or math class. You can see it here, the remediation rates are much higher for American Indian students in Montana University system. Um, other factors in poor achievement figure in. Although in many respects Native American populations either are not included in studies or presented on the basis of limited or questionable data, clearly a gap exists. Poverty also figures into the low achievement rate. Compared to the overall U.S. poverty rate, of 12.3% annual income for a family of four, the Native American rate is 25.4%. For our purposes in this presentation, we offer these demographics to show that Native students who, the Native students we serve are probably similar to those at your university, students with both reservation and urban experiences. The Indian Education for All Act mandated that we educate Indian students in a culturally responsive manner. What does that mean? From our perspective, culturally, culturally responsive pedagogy builds on the seven R's. Four of them uh, were outlined by Barnhart, uh, Ken, Ken, Ken Wei Li uh, about 20 years ago. Um, the first are respect, respect for cultural integrity of Indian students, respect for Native students for who they are. The second are relevance, that is to include the institutional legitimation of indigenous knowledge and skills, help students appreciate and build upon their customary forms of consciousness and representation as they expand the understanding of the world they live in, help them reconcile differences in the ways knowledges are produced by creating new ways of thinking, new ways of connecting literacy to all traditions. Uh, reciprocity involved making teaching and learning two-way processes, developing co-learning partnerships between faculty and students, between faculty and families and communities. Responsibility, that is to support Indian students to exercise responsi responsibility over their own lives, to support their families, communities, and tribes to nurture, protect, and guide their children, 
develop strategies and policies that emerge from a vision of working with American Indians toward a participatory goal of empowerment. Resilience, that, that requires recognizing the importance for Indian students to have people in their lives who nurture their spirit, stand by them, encourage and support them. Relatedness, relationships are the foundation of any educational effort involving Native people. Indian education for all, in fact, to a large extent, is about improving Native and non-Native relationships. To add to that, as you Kate at um, the seventh hour here, recognition, it is important to recognize the strength of Indian cultures and the accomplishments and contribution of Indian people. The seven hours capture many of the principles emerged in the field of multicultural education. Culturally relevant and re responsive pedagogies involve attending to, for example, diverse learning styles, cultural ways of thinking, problem-solving approaches, um, including culturally relevant content and integrating indigenous perspectives into the curriculum, building partnership between university faculty staff and parent, family, and community. Uh, all those uh, have been discussed for, for, for years, for decades. What I want to add one more point here is that um, is, is the intercultural communication piece to it. Um, Cross-cultural sensitivity and intercultural competence um, is, is an important part to consider. Sometimes we have the best intentions to practice the seven R's, but we fail to communicate our intention effectively across cultures. For instance, we want to talk to the students instead of listening to them, or we work with them as individuals instead of attending to their collectivist uh, cultural orientation. It is, so in other words, I want to make the point here is that it is essential that staff and faculty are provided with intercultural communication training. Cultural responsive approach has been advocated for, for, for decades, as I mentioned. Uh, while it serves the starting point, it's not enough. That's one of the points we want to get across today. A more rigorous approach is the critical, culturally sustaining, and revitalizing pedagogy, the SRP, that goes beyond being responsive or relevant to students' cultural experiences. It aims to support Native students to sustain and revitalize their cultures. Western schooling has impacted indigenous people in ways that have separated their identities from their languages, lands, and world views. Thus, from a social justice point of view, culturally sustaining, revitalizing pedagogy is, is, is essential. This approach highlights the importance of recognizing the need to reclaim and revitalize what has been disrupted and displaced by colonization. Uh, express, explicitly encouraging multilingualism and multiculturalism in practice and perspective among Indian students, supporting both traditional and evolving ways of cultural connectedness for Native students. I realize that at this point, we've been throwing so many ideas at you and heavy duty slides. You're coming at this new, and we are asking for a major kind of transformation of the way in which education is shaped. Um, so we apologize for that. It's just hard to leave all the moving parts out. So there is an article in the references on the 10 principles of decolonizing pedagogy. Um, on our campus, a young woman who earned her educational doctorate did a study of I, the student's experience of racism, for example, and what she found was the number one place on campus that they feel that racism at work is in the classroom. And it comes in the form of professors who don't know how to field questions of other students. 
it comes from lack of content that is relevant, even in courses, say, sociology courses on poverty, where Native American statistics are left out, um, and so on. So there, there are many ways in which this kind of pet, uh, this kind of model we're presenting is a, is wanting to move away from low the poor Indian and shift the focus on a more responsible way of educating all students that respects all students at once. Um, there's always the um, sense that people will feel left out. If this is done in the right way, everyone will feel included. So these 10 principles offer some ideas. The first is committing to educating yourself edu and also recognizing colonization and racism as ongoing processes. Um, study about Eurocentrism and Eurocentric education and how they focus, how they work as tools in colonization. Um, model self-reflexivity. That's another word for cultural humility, humility. And expect and prepare to navigate difficulties um, in the classroom. Carefully navigate potential trauma for indigenous and non-indigenous students and explore and commit to principles of indigenizing education. Be aware that indigenizing is insufficient without decolonizing. So that's a very complicated um, pedagogy, but what I want you to see, see in that is that the essential understandings are an effort to indigenize, to give people a kind of knowledge base to under and indigenization, the frameworks, the cultural background, the history, and so on. And decolonizing is more on the level of um, disabusing particular types of thinking. Um, so get to know your individual students and yet continue to see how they come out of their own collective reality and familial settings. And then develop a dialogue across and within disciplines and departments and find allies, people that can help you. In, in talking about all of that, we can't end by not saying where education fits in the pattern of colonialism. That could be um, far more than just one webinar to explain. But in this slide, I've emphasized the word cultural normativity because it's foundational to the way our um, system is set up. In other words, colonizing people is, a, is uh, a different matter. Settler colonialism is a process of settlement that institutionalizes the settler privileges materially and discursively. When we say discursively, we mean educationally. Constructing settlers and their culture as superior and modern and indigenous nations and their cultures as inferior and primitive. We're living with the legacy of settler normativity. That, um, the 1972 Constitution Committee was trying to revise our way of educating to create equality and equity at the same time. So at this point, we, we believe that it's a point in time for the, this kind of settler normativity to be unraveled in the way in which we've suggested to you. We appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shanley and Dr. Nagai. We appreciate your presentation. Um, I'm looking to the chat, and I, I, I'm just wondering if, if any of you have any questions that you'd like to pose. Um, while I'll give you a moment to enter your questions. Now, the slides individually will not be available, but the recording of the webinar will be, and um, we'll be sharing those out after the webinar um, in the next day or so. But 
you know, um, you mentioned uh, earlier Dr. Shanley or Dr. Nagai um, about cultural competency, competency <laughs> trainings, excuse me. Um, can you tell us more about what you cover in those um, and what what topics uh, go into that competency training? How often do you do them? Give us a little more details about that. Um, I have to say that we have, we're building an infrastructure for doing that on a more systematic and regular basis. Okay. Um, and some of the ways in which we we've approached it as we've um, brought in speakers and we've had workshops with students who talk about their experience. Um, we deal with talking about understandings that um, are deeper than um, say manner of speech or color of skin or the the obvious markers of difference. So um, I think it's kind of difficult for me to address because I'm not actively engaged in it. I'm not I'm not student support in the same way that I am an academic. Um, okay. Okay, and so then that, would that also fall within the question? My, my next question was around um, so many of the students fall within that remediation uh, piece, so many, many of the Native American students. Um, what types of supports are in place? Do you all have personalized learning um, types of, of things in place? Uh, how do you support those students that are in remediation courses? And how to get them back up to the norm? <laughs> To, to to be in out of remediation, if you will. Some of that happens on on the level of um, different departments and in different schools. So I'm less familiar with what they do um, in in the nitty gritty sense, but generally I understand, for example, the School of Health Sciences and Pharmacy has an extensive uh, personal um, counseling support mechanism for helping students. We have an American Indian Student Services office that provides um, on and off, depending on funding, to provide peer tutoring. So peers help other peers to express themselves and also field-based um, tutoring regularly that that office has office hours for people from the writing center so that the students can come to a safe space and talk with the writing coach. The Missoula Urban Indian Health Center um, sends over counselors who can help. Uh, he can who can see students on an individual basis um, throughout the week. Um, so those are some of the ways we do it. Um, I hope that's helpful. Okay. Sure. Yeah. No, that is. Um, here's a, a question from one of the attendees. Um, how could this? Uh, how could this work extend to international students from countries also affected by settler uh, colonialism or with Appalachian and or first generation students from underserved communities in higher education? My take on this is, is to really integrate um, the perspective and the issues about indigenous people around the world uh, in coursework, in courses. Um, here at the University of Montana, we have um, a program called International Development Studies. It's a minor. And in this minor program, uh, some of the core courses 
include uh, globalization of indigenous people or sustainability and indigenous um, issues. And so those courses extend beyond the context of North America. Um, those courses cover indigenous issues in Mexico uh, and in um, Southeast Asia, so on and so forth. So we actually provide scholarship for international students to join these minor programs. Uh, that's, that's one way. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, have you collected uh, data that indicates students' perceptions of their needs while in school? Um, well, we've had a, a lot of positions in transition um, in terms of student support. So a certain kind of data hasn't been collected, and as I said, the dashboard that's going to be coming up will be very helpful. But I serve as the co-advisor of a Native Student Council. They're called the Native American Student Advisory Council. And on that council, we all work together to identify how students perceive needs in the campus. Um, so we did a survey in the spring, and it, I didn't feel that the um, sample was large enough. It was a little over 10%. But we're going to do it again um, in a couple weeks here once the enrollment has settled down. And what we're trying to do in NASAC is get at things like how, how many miles do students drive to work? Do they support children? And that question is designed to include men who pay child support, who do not live with their um, children. And what, they, what the students see as their greatest obstacle, I can tell you um, that the, from the little study we did, the greatest obstacle they feel is money. Um, so we're working on things like trying to determine how many students um, take advantage of the Native American tuition waiver um, and just generally make sure information about who qualifies for that and how it's dispensed and so on can be accessed by students. Um, so yes, we. This is a work in progress for sure. I think our new dashboard is going to be very helpful for looking at and identifying needs. Okay, great. And um, have you gathered information or explored experiential learning as a framework for culturally responsive pedagogy? We haven't really conduct, conducted research with that construct, but our experience actually for the last 15 years is with K-12 in terms of implementing the culturally sustaining and revitalizing pedagogy and the place-based multicultural education approach. And we, our experience is that the most powerful dimension of that kind of education is to create a face-to-face -face connection. Uh, starting with the teachers, we take the teachers to the reservation and connect with tribal elders, and um, and then we also invite tribal educators come to the schools and create the partnership, uh, have, have um, tribal and non-tribal uh, educators work together, create the curriculum, and also um, to have elders, for example, to come to the classroom and teach students some language and talk about and, and tell stories. And all those face-to-face, person-to-person connection is the most powerful uh, part of Indian education for all. And maybe you can call that experiential learning. We call, this, uh, we call that place-based education, and that's the construct we use, but without that Face-to-face, -face, person to person, face to face. Many of many many of the educators, administrators, or teachers 
would not want to um, be involved in implementing in education for all. Uh, some of them are afraid, some of them don't want to make mistakes, some of them don't care, and some of them think, oh, this is um, an extra thing I don't have time for. So that that might be what you call experience digital learning. And our findings show that that is very important. Uh, without that, any any kind of curriculum materials would be just print of paper and it's not meaningful. Um, I would add to what uh, Phyllis is saying that one of the things Native American Studies has done for mm, 25 years uh, has is extensively supporting Native American clubs because when the students come to campus, they want involvements that speak to them um, and they want to be among a group of peers as they gain some leadership skills. They also want... My apologies. Oh, oh. <laughs> they, they also want recognition by their home communities that they're that they're making their communities proud. And so we've had two were um, classes, one for um, fundraising and one for event planning for the powwow. And it's it's one of the largest student-run powwows in the United States. And we have a Native student who is earning her doctorate in counseling ed who's studying how leadership is grown from that kind of experience of involvement in student clubs. We have ABLE, which is the business students. We have GAIO, which is the general, all that's the powwow comes out of that. We have NALSA, which is for law students. And then we have ACES, which is for science and engineering students. Um, in the past, we've had a film native writers and filmmakers group. We don't have that going right now. We also had a graduate general graduate group, which we don't have going. But those kinds of clubs make a world of difference for students feel comfort, cultural comfort within the institution. But they need the support of others. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, what do institutions of higher education located in states where tribes were removed from and don't have a critical mass of indigenous students can do to attract Native American students and respond effectively to their academic needs? Um, that's a tricky question without specifics of which state you're talking about um, because some states neighbor on states that do have high populations. Um, one of the things I would say is that bringing, bringing Native students in or Native faculty in clusters is helpful to them. Uh, cluster hiring, there's lots been written about that. But um, as a, I can speak personally as someone who's often been the only one <laughs> in various stages of my education who was Native American, that you you get uh, diversity fatigue. Um, and I, a couple years ago, I met the author of a book called uh, When Race Becomes Real. Her name is Singley, I think. Anyway, she's a, it was a wonderful book. I bought a bunch of copies and gave it to a bunch of friends. But her book is about being a diversity person, being the only one. As she's an African-American woman, and she was brought into somewhere in the Wisconsin school system and how horrible it was for her. And I just think that people... Administrators need to develop humility about what they're asking of others when they bring them into an environment where they're a clear minority um, and just develop sensitivity about that before you do it. 
and then support structures that are appropriate to the population. Dr. Shanley, can you repeat the title of that book? I think the title of it is um, When Race Becomes Real. Got it. Okay. We just want to make sure we, ha we, get, we have all of the information for, uh, to share out in the, in the follow-up mm -hmm. email. Uh, there was another question around, um, you had mentioned the, the, the online course. Um, and is it possible to see the course you created? Uh, yes. Is that possible? Uh, yeah. And is it? Yes. Maybe Kate can talk a little bit about who actually created it. It was, a um, it was created by the AMA group, um, and well, it was created by the Office of Public Instruction Indian Ed Office, and the AMA group uh, contributed uh, ample critiques over and over. Um, and so, at the end of each of these sections, there's a a quiz. There, the quizzes are pretty. Uh, straightforward and in the middle of October we will do an assessment on campus here to see how many people have taken the exams and then we're going to start um, meeting with units to to talk about the content and try to develop some ongoing um, conversation. Great. Um, we have someone who says, um, is, is this something that anyone can access or, uh, and can they take it if they would like, any of our uh, attendees? We'd have to make special arrangements for that to happen. Okay. I'm not sure how it could happen, but if someone emails me privately, um, I can see if that's possible. Um, it's on our university Moodle, and so you have to be a university employee to access it. I'm sorry, but the one that Phyllis talked about on the Office of Public Instruction website, it was designed a number of years ago for high school or for K through 12, um, and that is publicly available. Um, so if you go into that website and poke around, you can and find it, and all you have to do is register, but you don't have to be a teacher in Montana. Uh, okay, so maybe that's, that's great. Out. And where mm -hmm. is that, where can that course be found? That's on the Montana Office of Public Instruction Indian Education website. I, I'd have to, I'd like to say it's easy to find, but the truth is you have to poke around and poke around and then you'll find it. Okay, so we will see if our office can poke around <laughs> um, <laughs> and make sure we, get, we provide the, the actual link directly to there in the follow-up email. Um, just a few comments uh, before we wrap up here, uh, but you know, excellent webinar. I need some of the theoretical constructs presented to develop an outreach program here in healthcare. Is it okay if I contact the speakers? Uh, can we share your emails to, with with the uh, attendees? Today's attendees. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Um, another one. You you made a statement regarding cultural culturally humility. Um, and it's so real when the one person is brought in to do something in terms of retention and recruitment and there is no social support for the person to sustain themselves. So it's, it, you make a, a valid point around how there is, the social support is so crucial as well um, for, for the students, for faculty and so forth. Um, another, another comment here, thank you for your presentation. My program recruits and works with Native students that are attending graduate health programs. I'm always looking at ways we can enhance support as there is such a shortage of Native health care providers. Uh, we need more healers and persistence is crucial. Thanks again for the inform informative webinar. Um, so I think that covers just about any everything. Uh, do you have, I have some last minute, um, some, some, uh, 
announcements here at the end. Was there anything else before I, I move on to the announcements there for closing, Dr. Shanley and Dr. Nagai? Oh, one slide that we eliminated along the way because of time. We mm -hmm. wanted to talk about how your institutions present themselves to the outside world regarding diversity that includes Native Americans. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been struggling for years to, on ver various levels here at this institution, to please not just grab um, a, a powwow picture to put up to talk about diversity. If you go to, for example, the football game, have the photographers take pictures of diverse uh, bunches of students. Um, present Native students in the classroom or the cafeteria. Make your website avoid the stereotypes, the um, dog and pony show of culture. Instead, show Indian students as, as getting an education, as learners, as, as going out in the field and, and um, getting their hands dirty or uh, whatever, things like that. Um, that's important both for you as institutions in terms of your recruitment and retention, and it's good for natives, the Native communities and students who want to feel included in higher education, not like a sideshow. Yeah. The last thing Sorry. I want to add is how important it is to include the voices of Native people as part of the decolonizing pedagogy. That's why I was hoping we have time to show this video. Um, but that's the kind of video that I suggested the course developer to include at the beginning of the course, not at the end, not by the way. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Nagai, if, sure. if sure. you could send I that guess link. I went off that, no, no, it's okay. If, if you could share that link with us. Um, for the video, yeah, we can yeah. share it in the in the follow up email. Uh, and yeah, that's thank you both so great, much. Uh, okay. Yes, thank you both so much for for your time. Um, in closing, I just want to say uh, thank you all for joining us as well, all the attendees. Uh, to hear more about more of our um, just events and. Uh, webinars and so forth, meetings coming up, please follow us on Twitter at APLUOAS to stay in the know of what our office is up to. Also, um, some upcoming meetings. Save the date for our next webinar, December 17th, for the next Commission on Access, Diversity, and Excellence webinar. Uh, we would also like to invite you to our annual meeting, uh, November 10th through 12th, in beautiful San Diego, California. and. Um, I will share the links to both our Twitter as well as the summer, uh, the annual meeting in November uh, in the follow-up email with you. Thank you all again, and we will see you next time. Have a great day.